YouTube forever. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, welcome to uh, Urban Nature Walk. I can't remember exactly what the title of this was. Uh, my name is Naki Braga. I am a urban agroecologist, permaculture designer, uh, maybe have some pretense of being a community organizer based here in Lexington. Uh, very thankful to Dr. Phillips for having invited me to participate in this. Um, what else do we want to say about, about this walk? Um, I just saw the description of the event for the first time last night. So I think uh, what was on there was that we were going to walk to a formerly redlined uh, neighborhood, which is Lexington's East End. For us to get there, uh, one way walking at my gate would be almost 40 minutes, and that's without stopping to talk about anything. So I'm going to suggest that we don't that we don't do that. Um, however, there's plenty to talk about here. We're in the United States, so we don't have to go far to see racialized patterns of urban development, and we're definitely going to see that here on campus. So what I'm going to suggest is that we take a walk around this block, uh, maybe cross one street. Um, but we can go clockwise, we can go counterclockwise, and uh, there's few of you here enough that uh, I want to cater to whatever you're interested in. Yeah, what do you guys want to say right here? Yeah, and, and maybe just just some like a menu perhaps is obviously we can do tree ID, right? We can do yeah. winter tree ID, and we can just kind of keep it to that, or we can maybe go a little deeper into ethnobotanical uses of these trees or cultural significance. Um, we can talk about the buildings and, and architecture, of course. Okay. No worries. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and I don't want to go into more detail than anyone feels like they can absorb. And I also don't want to just be the guy who's like, and this is a that tree, and this is a that tree, and everyone's like, wow, that's merely interesting, right? So I, I, I want you all to get uh, whatever you can out of this. To that end, please interrupt me. Please ask questions. Please point something out. If I did not indicate it, you want to know about it. I am not a super genius expert guy, so you will point to something and say, what's that? And I'll be like, I have no idea. Um, but I'll tell you why I have no idea, and I can at least say, here's some of the things that maybe I can try to figure out at least what family it's in or something like that. Right? How does that sound to everyone? Great. No. Great? Okay. All right. I'm at, I'm also interested in like the impact of the university on the like the neighborhood dynamics. Oh, yes. That's, yeah. That's my yeah. jam. And all, <laughs> along those lines, I'm, I, I don't know if we'll get far in, out enough into the city for this, but I'm curious about the effect of like real estate investment and disinvestment on urban nature, which oh. might tie well into the university stuff anyway. Sweet. All right, yeah, there's, oh, wow. there's so much density of stuff to talk about here. Yeah. And, uh, anyone who's been on a plant walk before, sometimes you don't even leave the parking right. lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> so stop me if you're like, let's keep moving. Or, we go or over to Oliver Lynn's, Lewis. I'm sorry? Nick? We go over to Oliver Lewis and like the... That would be a little too far, I think. Oh, okay. But, but yeah, we're, sorry, we're gonna, my geography on campus is pretty bad. No, plenty of geography. Plenty. Lexington has amazing uh, and very complicated history. A lot of trauma embedded in this landscape. I'm speaking about Kentucky as a whole, North America as a whole, right? Um, but this is an interesting kind of, to your point about development and the interface between uh, town and gown or whatever people call it. We are on the north end of uh, University of Kentucky's campus here. So this is... Uh, sort of the the front lines or, or whatever you want to call it yeah. and and we have yeah there will be indications of things that have happened just in the last decade or two um, let's start right here can I, I, I have one more question please uh, so one thing I'm interested in is uh, the disinvestment that you see at the species level and where you see things that are intentional ornamental cultivars versus things that have been are spontaneous allowed to be there on their own oh. Um, and how you see power at the species level as well. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I think so we can get into some might, of that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to rely on you to help develop that discourse a little bit whenever you see a, an opportunity sure. for it, if you don't mind. Um, but let's start right here. Patterson Hall, right? Uh, 1903? I thought this thing was built in the 40s. I don't know. <laughs> this, this is the first uh, women's This is the new stuff. This is the new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the university 
um, knew that they would, you don't want to go to our legislature in Kentucky and talk about the Kentucky Bill of Rights. So they knew that they were going to be able to do additional dormitories. We had dorms that were probably um, akin to the dorms that I grew up with where you shared a bedroom. Sometimes you had to bunk your beds, <coughs> right? So that you could have that futon or that, you know, that round chair. Um, and um, oh, here's Claire. And um, anyway, that's what we had. The university decided that there were so many kids that were raised with their own bedrooms um, that they needed to refabricate the entire residential experience for students. So they partnered with a company called EDR, um, and these buildings have a 50-year lease. The company, the private company, uh, built these buildings. Lease, they are leasing the land from the university for a term of 50 years. Um, these dorms have been here five years, six years maybe? 2016, I want to say they were completed. Okay, so a little bit longer than that. I don't know how many times the rent has gone up on them so far. Um, and students, when I advise that, you know, we've still got 20 some odd, uh, 40 some odd more years on their lease, they say they'll never last. So, um, but they do have elevators, they have granite countertops, they have, you know. Spared yeah. no expense. Um, Tempur-Pedic beds, because Tempur-Pedic is headquartered here in Lexington. Okay. So, so yeah. They're private, and they're private profit. The, the company makes all the money. The yes, university doesn't yes. have any... The university gets some share of it, and I can't remember. I read the contract way back when. Um, we get some percentage. It either grows or it shrinks through time. Sure. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's consider Patterson Hall. This is real masonry, right? These bricks might even have straw in them. I don't know. Versus these balloon frame, stick, stick frame all the way up, and then a facade, right? That 50 year lease period probably corresponds to an internal rate of return for the investor. These things started falling apart the minute they were done being built, right? And so they don't have to be here for longer than 50 years because everyone who wanted to get money out of it has already extracted that value. And everyone else, the city of Lexington, is going to be left with uh, yeah. this, Good right? And, and so this is happening on campus, but we yeah. can point to plenty of other uh, five over ones being built all over town. So, so that's good context for, for right here, I think. Well, and because this is all new, all of this landscaping is new, right? And my office is in Patterson Tower, which is the you know white monolithic academic building that I think every university has. Um, and when I look down my window, you can see it's beautiful colors because we have gorgeous hardwoods. Well, they all got taken out, you know, in support of the construction of these dorms. So, uh, the university is, has not been a good agent of the urban canopy. Are you a tree campus? What? Are you we a tree are. campus? Like yes, tree campus okay. USA. Okay. Yeah. Very low tree. bar. To it's a low bar, yeah. But it's, it's still no, we, 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 we have, have to have a, a We have a full-time arborist. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, we'll, talk yeah. about, we'll talk about some controversies that have arisen recently in, yeah. in campus <laughs> tree management. Let's talk about the trees. Yeah. Uh, who knows what these two are right here? These are ginkgo bilobas. Oh, okay. I would have known if we <laughs> yeah, Winter's always the, the right. expert course. So these uh, these are just super interesting, right? Everybody knows, oh, ginkgo, it helps with memory and stuff like that. Chinese in origin. It is a relict clade, which means it is not just the only species in its family, it's the only species in its order. Everybody else died out in like the Pliocene or something like that. <laughs> Um, and these survived in a very small region of central China and have since gone all over Asia, Korea, Japan. Uh, some of the oldest living specimens that we know of are around uh, Buddhist monasteries. So we know that uh, that particular group played a really important role in uh, moving it around. Uh, the seeds are edible uh, as well as the medicinal qualities. Um, and. Uh, yeah, what else? I mean, there's so much to say about, you know, the way it reproduces. Again, it's this living fossil. Very cool. Why is it here? Henry Clay, a uh, dirty bastard slave owner, also, I guess, the most famous politician in Kentucky. Central uh, Kentucky. 
before Mc McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Um, but he loved these things. And so why do we have all these non-native ginkgos everywhere? It's because of this history and, and honoring the legacy of Henry Clay, I guess. Um, but they're very cool. They, they turn beautiful yellow. Uh, they drop all their leaves, which are these very unique kind of uh, fan-shaped. Um, they drop them all at the same time, so that's kind of nice for people who need to do fall cleanup or whatever. Um, it's very and, resilient to air pollution and getting hit by cars. If, yes, uh, they do. They do good in tough soils, um, which urban soils are tough soils, right? Think about if all the if all this was constructed recently, these soils have been beaten up. They've been driven over everything. So, like Dr. Phillips said, everything is new except that. Right? There's no way they planted that in 2016. So they did do an okay job. Let's let's go for it. They, yeah, um, let's walk. Get our we'll going. start moving. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and, and somebody keep me honest on time. I know we're not going to get uh, super far, but this is uh, an English oak or a pedunculate oak, I think is another name. Quercus rober. Um, if you are looking for oak ID tips, at the end of these twigs, you will see these buds kind of clustered together. That's a classic oak right there. Um, we also have a little bit of a display of what's called marcescence, uh, which is just that these leaves are persisting uh, over the winter. So oaks and beeches are both in the beech family. They're very old, old genetic lineage. Um, and so we don't necessarily know exactly why this tree does this, but uh, it could be that, that there's a lot of theories. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, the way that leaves abscess or, 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 or drop from uh, maples and things that you're a little more familiar with uh, is different than how these trees do it. And so the way that abscission layer forms, uh, the, the phenolic compounds that are produced uh, are just a little different. And so why is it evolutionarily adaptive? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. It may have to do with insulation in the winter. It may have to do with protecting uh, the, uh, the leaf scar for the next year. Uh, but anyway, it's an English oak. This is from Europe, a, another non-native. Uh, but this, I think, is a, a different kind of relic. This is a relic, I think, from when UK's campus was much smaller. And we did have an arboretum on the south side. And especially in the early 20th century, there was just more funding and interest for horticulture. And so you had a lot more diversity of trees planted around because especially the, the campus itself had to be the arboretum. So we needed to be able to take students around and show them what an English show looks like and all this kind of stuff. Um, but this is, this is very much still popular in the horticultural trade. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep walking, we'll keep walking. Uh, here on your left, these are bald cypresses. They have a, uh, they are a deciduous conifer, which means that they have uh, little needle-like fine threaded leaves, uh, but then they drop them in the winter. Uh, it is a southern species, grows more in like the Mississippi floodplain area, further west in Kentucky, um, grows in swamps, can uh, grow in standing water. It won't root in standing water, but if it gets inundated after it's established, it can be fine. And so that has a lot to do with urban soils. You will uh, probably, probably a theme that you'll see again and again as we talk about these trees is bottomland adapted species. And when, when you think of a bottomland adapted species or something that grows in a wetland, don't be thinking it needs a lot of water. Be thinking it doesn't need a lot of oxygen. It's actually adapted to soils that aren't very well aerated. So compacted urban soils fit that. And so you're gonna see that again and again and again that what people are finding works well, especially over time in urban soils, what can tolerate urban soils usually tends to be something from a, a swamp somewhere. Um, and then uh, these trees here, this line of trees, are willow oaks. 
Uh, these are used all over campus as well. They grow very uh, fast, very tall, very straight. They'll, they'll get over 100 feet. Um, how can I describe? They're popular because uh, the ratio of the central leader stem to the lateral branches is just pleasing. It's, it's just going to make a really nice, when these all grow up and, and form a canopy here, it looks good. Um, and it is, it is a native oak. It's, it's more to the south of us, although it does extend up the coast into Pennsylvania, its native range. Um, but it gives us all of, uh, you know, some of the good habitat support for our, our insects, uh, pollinating insects, the, the, uh, all, all, really all the invertebrates that feed on this that then become the base of the food chain for our, our uh, songbirds and, and so forth, right? Um, are willow oaks the ones that have the kind of non-oak looking leaf? They have a very non-oak looking leaf. It looks like a willow leaf, um, but they are a red oak. And you can tell because there is a, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the word for it. Right now. It's, it's a little spine. It's like a, anyone, anyone who's a botanist? No, <laughs> I can't, I, I can't remember. I used to know what you're talking about. Yeah, I have, it's on the tip of my tongue. I look like a fool. Is it Kino or something like that? No, no, okay. it's. I learned that from the New York Times. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was on letterbox. No, but uh, but the way that you tell, sometimes people will say, well, a, a white oak has lobes that are rounded, and a red oak has lobes that are sharp, and that's not actually true. It's uh, it's it's the little needle appendage at, at the end of the lobe that tells you, oh, this is a red oak. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say red oak, uh, that is just a category within the genus Quercus, the the oak genus, um, and, and people. Well, we have we have red oaks uh, here. I think uh, that's that's one here, the the big one behind. Let's uh, no. Let me. everyone just calls red oak. Um, eh, what do I want to say about that? Um, but the red oak is kind of the, the classic dominant northern hardwood, uh, acidic soils, uh, beautiful form, uh, really nice bark. That's probably the best way to identify it in the winter is you see kind of the, uh, the ridges that run all the way up the bark and have a little bit of a light texture in between that's that's your red oak uh, next in here these conifers those are eastern hemlocks and we can uh, let's let's just walk around more ginkgos mm. yes yes that's and that's a great topic right there so eastern hemlock uh, very widespread all the way to you know the west western uh, coast in the continent all throughout Canada really important it's not the biggest tree but it forms a, a really important part of the architecture of like the mid story let's say especially in our in our eastern if you go east from here and get more into the sandy areas like the Red River Gorge you're gonna see a lot of these um, they have been they are seriously under threat because of an invasive insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid that has been knocking them out. Uh, there is a treatment that you can uh, you can put a pesticide into the tree and protect them. These have been protected, and so this is a this is a really good point. This is something that we have to take uh, ownership of in urban areas, I think, because if I drive that hour east and get to the Red River Gorge which is an internationally renowned uh, geologic area. It's beautiful. All the hemlocks are dying uh, because of the, the woolly adelgid. And it's happening on a landscape scale, right? There's no way to get enough technicians in there to treat every single tree. As they die, uh, you know, they try to treat the ones around the trails and stuff, but as they die, invasives are coming in from the roadways because that mid story is opening up and all of a sudden the sunlight's penetrating through. So you have things like uh, uh, Miscanthus 
uh, Chinese silver grass is coming in and just absolutely obliterating whatever kind of sensitive understory is in those systems. Here in an urban area where we have higher density of management, we can protect these and we can protect the biodiversity a lot more effectively. And so I'm thinking about long-term climate impacts, some of the things that we're dealing with, we have to take responsibility in our urban areas may actually be our best chance to preserve pockets of, of real biodiversity. Uh, and then, you know, have, have those genetics so that we can propagate them back out as we, as we uh, have the opportunity. That's, that's an idea that I'm developing. I'm, I'm interested in how people feel about that. Um, but when I see landscape scale transformation and when I think about climate change and what's really gonna happen, that's why I focus as an ecologist so much on the urban areas because I think it's gonna, you know, it, it is the ethno-botanical uh, kind of uh, case to be made that, that if humans are not directly involved in managing and stewarding these landscapes, uh, they're gonna die out. And these landscapes evolved, co-evolved with human management, right? And that's something that's often kind of left out of the story when we talk about preservation and, oh, get humans out of here. Humans only mess things up. Well, actually getting humans out of there is messing things up, right? Uh, it's one of the same things with the monarch habitat. Yes. Um, humans have a huge impact in the urban area to maintain monarch habitat in areas where agriculture has obliterated monarch Absolutely. Habitat. Yeah, does, does everybody know about monarch habitat and kind of Basically just, just these ideas that we have um, insects, uh, all kinds of animals that have co-evolved with particular plants and share their life cycle with those plants in, in various complicated ways. Uh, and so we have to maintain that biodiversity in order for those insects to be able to complete their life cycle. And so if we lose that biodiversity everywhere else, maybe it's just in your front yard that you have enough control that you can have a little habitat and uh, you know if we all do that that's the idea that we we get that to scale okay this uh this is a tupelo and this is sylvatica it's a black gum tree uh, another edible fruit probably the uh the best defining characteristic for this one in the winter is that the branches there's a couple good examples up there they meet the the central trunk at a right angle it's almost like they just come out at 90 degrees and that's not something you see often but this one will do it uh, we have curb cuts here this is a rain garden another swamp tree another swamp tree very very popular right now people are over planting this arborists are over planting this in urban areas because it just works so well say something about this McDonald's. <laughs> Not that long ago, this McDonald's was sort of the classic McDonald's with the, uh, the gabled roof and the golden arches. It was set back off the street with a drive lane around it, the drive roof. And uh, it was, maybe still is, I haven't been in there, uh, a gathering point for a lot of unhoused individuals, a lot of people who are coming to this part of town to panhandle or busk. Um, basically people that the university did not want interacting with the students or did not want the students and their parents to see uh, and I think McDonald's also kind of had that feeling so anyway that is just a really interesting design for a building because if you look at it they've been, they've turned themselves away from the street right they are completely non-welcoming they do not want you to think that there's a place for you to go sit down in there um, so that was a very intentional design decision, I think, for that particular McDonald's. Um, and it's pretty interesting to see, I think. Um, keep going here. <clears throat> By the way, what's your prognosis for the headlock in general? Yeah, I mean, you had a little bit of hope in what you said about the management, but it sounds bleak every time I hear about it. Yeah, so the most promising thing I've heard about Hemlock recently, and I, I cannot um, 
I can't remember the species off the top of my head, but there is a natural predator to the woolly adelgid uh, from Asia that the Forest Service has been researching and what it was the the first the first time that they have okayed the use of a foreign predator to be released in the wild to try and control this. Now that's a uh, the man who swallowed the fly and then swallowed the frog, swallowed the frog, right? So, uh, but you know, what is the alternative is we're using uh, industrially produced pesticides to try and keep up with this and that's not sustainable. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a, it's, it's bleak. Yeah. It is definitely bleak. Yeah. And, and we have, def, we have lost, right? We've lost the chestnut. Yeah. We've lost most of the American elm. Uh, ash is getting hit really hard. Uh, so it's by no means like a, this, this is a condition of modernity that these species are getting hit this hard. Um, okay, these are swamp white oaks. So in that name, swamp, remember, right? So another one that's become very popular with arborists recently because it's going to tolerate these urban soils. And we'll walk away from this uh, traffic here. Is this a special cultivar that grows like this? Yep, like a sweet yep, gum? Yep. So. All right, so a couple things I want to say about this. One is, are you all familiar with the concept of legibility? Right, um, so this is Avenue of Champions. This is where the conservative family with their precious child is gonna come and get their first impression of, do we want to send them here, right? So it's gotta look good and it can't look too crazy. And too crazy might be a bunch of different trees, but if they're all the same tree, anybody can look at this and say, that was intentional. They knew what they were doing. I can understand this. This is legible to me. I'm not, I'm not confused. It's not crazy, right? So you will see that again and again, even though greater biodiversity, uh, closer spacings, different spacings, right? Nature's not planting in a straight line. We're doing that just for ourselves. Um, might be better, but the university has dictated this is what this needs to look like. And so to Nick's point, these are some weird looking trees, right? The branches are what's called fastigate, which means that genetically they are kind of coming at this weird angle to the central leader. And so people say, you know, this is, this is ornamental or whatever. Uh, and you see the marcescence again, the leaves hanging out. We can keep walking because these are all, these are all swamp white oaks. What is, what is the bullshit about fastigate or columnar is the other word people use. The bullshit is, if I look at the Lexington planting manual and I look at the category that swamp white oak is under, there's a certain square footage of tree canopy that is associated with that. And so potentially as a developer or whatever, I could get credit for planting these oaks because I'm replacing or improving or whatever the tree canopy. But if the oaks are fastigate, they're not actually ever going to spread out and make that canopy. They're not gonna provide shade. They're not going to evapotranspire the same way. Um, but on paper, it looks like I planted a bunch of oaks. And so I don't know if that was the case at this development specifically, but that happens all over town that, you know, that we have these lists of, oh, the developer fulfilled what they needed to do, but they just planted a bunch of columns. Can I ask you a question? Sorry. Please. How, if at all, does this like impact the lifespan of the tree? That is a good question. I do not know exact. I actually don't know. I doubt these cultivars are even that have old. been around long enough. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is that these are these are likely to not likely. They are. They're all clones. They're all clones of each other, and you can see where they were grafted to a rootstock. Oh, right. That's right. That yeah. You see that. And so you're gonna see that. You see that with cherries. You see. There's a few that are like very much. Wait, that so is that the means case. That no, in, in a nursery, they grafted them together and then grew it like this. Yeah. But, but yeah, this is, 
it, it is an oak root stock, right? It did graft and it's it's gonna work. It's probably a, a natural, like a native straight species swamp white oak roots, but then with this particular little twig out of it. What, what's the advantage? Like why would someone, is it cheaper for somebody to do it that way? Than to no. just, so why would, it's just for the visual. Aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. can't, you can't grow, if you took this tree from seed, it wouldn't grow in this weird, fast to get straight. columnar right. way. Right. It's like someone found this weird tree in the wild and they're like, wow, I'm going to take a cutting of this branch yep. and then clone it a hundred times and people are going to love it because it grows in this weird way and car dealerships can line their thing with it or whatever. It's right. A, it doesn't cult, spread. It's a cross. It's a real it's a This is? It is it, yeah. Oh. It's a cultivate. It's a cultivar. To, that's how it got to be this one. Okay. There's a sweet gum that you'll see that looks like this too all over the place. Yes, yes. Why don't we go into the student center and warm up for a minute? Well, let's do it. We can, okay. Maybe we can look at that little arboretum, you know, the, the little sure. bowl. I don't know what's in the little bowl. We'll take this. Pretty dang cool. It is. The wind is biting today. And you have antifreeze for blood. This is what I'm saying. Oh, I don't know about all that. <laughs> Not. <laughs> That's the secret. Do you want my hand warmers? No, no, no. Thank you. Should, should we take like a jumping jack break, you know? Get the well, blood flowing. Get, get the blood flowing, y'all. Um, there's coffee. Here, just in this little patch, some, some classic uh, urban species. Uh, saucer magnolias. Uh, the, this one here, really important. This is a uh, honey locust. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's called a Shade Master. So this is another one that's a brand name, right? Someone copyrighted this tree. Uh, the, the plates, the way this bark looks is, is really what uh, keys it in for me. Um, in nature, in the wild, this, uh, let's see, th this tree is actually a bit of an evolutionary ghost because it has thorns all over it, giant thorns. In fact, the, the botanical name is Gladitia tricanthos, which means three thorns, because the thorns have thorns, and sometimes the thorns' as thorns have thorns. It's pretty intense. It looks like uh, it's protecting itself from a mastodon or something. It's protecting itself from some kind of megafauna that's no longer on the landscape. But we don't want something like that right here on campus, right? So again, a... Uh, a genetic mutation that someone has cloned and patented and this one actually does not produce uh, seeds either so easier cleanup all that kind of stuff uh, the thing about honey locusts in the urban area is that they became super popular in like the 1970s with landscape architects so you will often see honey locusts and you'll be like that was built in the 70s that was built in the 70s because they just put them everywhere it's like they didn't have any other trees so that's a really interesting way that you can look at the the history of a landscape and, and maybe tell who who put it there right um, yeah so i know these are really important for bees and i'm wondering if the genetic mutated version is uh if, whether that affected its blooming and nectar yeah these are male all, all oh, these are and okay. so yeah they, they produce no flower no fruit okay that's so so that yeah, just, so that affects the uh, pollination, the pollinator community. Right Absolutely, here. yeah. These are all these are all trade-offs that people have made for primarily aesthetic reasons. Or do you want to talk a little bit about why cities don't like to plant female? Why we have so many male trees? Uh, ginkgo is a great is a great <laughs> way to talk about that. Why? Please. No, no, go ahead. I I, I would love. I I'm sick of myself talking. <laughs> no, I do it all the time. Please. Well, so the flowers are the fruit, right? And female flowers become fruit, which, uh, so in this case, this guy is in the legume family, Fabaceae, and creates a little bean pod, little skinny bean pod. And actually the inside honey locust tastes like honey, the little, the pulp, not the seeds. Um, and so, yeah, you can give it to a little kid and they'll just, they'll love it right out of their hand. Um, but you don't necessarily want to clean all that stuff up. Uh, you know, it does have that pulp in it, so a student walks on it, squishes it on the sidewalk, and then that stains and stuff, right? That's, and, and this is a relatively clean fruit versus, let's say, a female ginkgo, which not only puts on the giant juicy fruit, but also smells really bad, right? Stinko ginkgos. Um, so you will, you will see that with a lot of things, and uh, as an agroecologist who works with urban agroforestry, 
we do have problems with that where people say we don't want these as fruit trees as street trees, right? What are some ways that we can get around that? A good example is this, uh, this tree back here. This is service berries. This is my favorite fruit in the world. Amazing. Also called June berries. Amelanchier is the genus. Um, called June berries because they tend to ripen in June, but that's probably going to change. Maybe we'll start calling them May berries. I don't know. Um, but the birds are all over these. They're tiny. They have very short shelf life, so you can't find them in stores, but you can eat them right out of your hand. And again, give them to any kid. It doesn't matter. They will die of happiness. It's like vanilla and blueberry. It's amazing. But the birds get them. You never have to clean anything up. So this is a, a great native fruit tree, beautiful early spring flowers. You can see the buds are starting to swell on these. Um, and, and they will not create any problems for, for cleanup. So in, the, in this situation, because I live in New York and we have the female ginkgos literally everywhere, you know, so, so does that just mean that the city wasn't bothered to like carefully curate which trees or is it more of like an actual unruly nature sort of situation? So, so often what will happen is that municipalities or whoever will buy the tree and they specify male only and then the contractor plants it <laughs> and that tree is going to take a few years to flower and put on fruit or whatever and the contractor's long gone um so yeah it could be it could be a number of or things is it like like when did this practice yeah. start because also like the yeah. trees have been there for like new ones on my block are are the, yeah the ones in, in bay ridge so one that. of the things about it is that so it started really in the 50s that they yeah. really focused on only planting males um but one of the things now is that it increases how much pollen there is in the air oh. and their pollen has nowhere to go so when you have all these male plants and no females for the pollen to be attracted to you have a ton allergies. of pollen in the air and your allergies are really really bad huh. so it can be a it's a human health issue yeah. as well um huh. so i don't know if that's i'm not in um arboriculture enough to know if that is one of the trends that's moving back to planting females but it has been an issue for allergy sufferers in one reason. Yeah. Urban allergies are just as bad as elsewhere. And there, there is a, an enormous ginkgo in a famous uh, Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville that was planted by Henry Clay so it's really really big and it has genetically mutated to have a female off growth of it if I, if I remember correctly. So is there, uh, just really Life quick, finds a way. another reason for, for planting just the males is, is a proprietary thing. It's like the company owns this particular, if no. they like did a, like this one you said was kind of created in a lab or whatever. I mean, that's not a thing. Like, they Gin don't want other people to be able to plant it. Ginkgo does powers. have some, some cultivars, yeah. Oh, okay. You should, so you will you will often see like in quotes that it, like so this one is Laditia tricanthos shade master yeah okay. yeah and so okay. someone patented that yeah. okay I thought maybe that's shade why they master. made them male only because they don't want people planting it without buying it kind of a thing like, no no but if, if you if you yeah. know your plants and you know how to propagate things yeah. there are a lot of things okay. that you can propagate from cuttings and oh. yeah they don't want that knowledge <laughs> getting out okay. Okay. Yeah. and you could also graft on fruiting stuff onto right. um, other yeah. Like if you have a white mulberry and you want tasty mulberries. White mulberries are tasty. No <laughs> oh, well. The birds like them. <laughs> that let's, go, yes. let's go into the student uh, center. There, there is a really good point about them. I don't know if there's any truth to that theory. Yeah, so there's liability issues, and yeah. that's going to depend on who the property owner is and what they, mm. they want to say. The, the mess and the cleanup the is mess. definitely... The but then But then with ginkgo, it's also the smell. People really... Yeah. But it is, it is a super culturally important um, food yeah. to, to a lot of people. And so you do have, you do have folks who come out and they, they're looking for ginkgos, and they, you know, they get disappointed because they're all male. And they thought they... So wherever there are females, there are certain members of our community that really like to, to go out at that particular time of year. That's a, a yearly thing for them. Um, All right, we're going, we're going, we're cold, we're cold. This one right here is a sugar maple. Um, you can see it's getting ready to start flowering. It's just barely, barely getting ready and hopefully it doesn't, uh, it's too early for it to flower. So hopefully it doesn't get knocked out. Um, but sugar maples, 
Here's another maple. This is a paper bark maple. I'm just going to point it out because it has this exfoliating bark that's very ornamental. It's a non-native, um, but that, that exfoliating bark is a winter interest, people call it. So that's one reason why it's so popular in the landscape. The sugar maple, culturally amazingly important, right? On Turtle Island, we did not have for a very long time sugar cane or honeybees. So people here have and do relied on the sugar maple to get sweets. Um, the, the really cool thing about sugar maple is that if you ask a little kid to draw a tree, they basically draw you that lollipop, right? That's sugar maple. Sugar maple is going to give you that stereotypical, this is what a tree looks like kind of deal. Not all maples do that, but, but this one will. Um, yeah, so we have some mechanical damage here. This, I mean, this tree's gonna have to be replaced, yeah. right? Like this is, there's no way that it's gonna be able to compartmentalize this rot. It's, it's gotten deep in here. It's just gonna get worse and worse. So this is a, this is a hazard, right? I mean, I can just pull that right out. Um, sorry, tree, but thank you for teaching us this. So, so what is that? That's a mower or a string trimmer, probably over and over and over again, right? And ideally, that will protect it. Let's talk about this as we miss the cross <laughs> signal, sorry. Um, but average tree paint, 15 years. Yeah. Yes. 15 years? 10 okay, to 15. Wow. For, for really? just that species or Any. all species? Anything. Really? Good. Yes. Urban street tree. Yeah. Wow. Average. Do you have any because they get hit. Your, um, because they get hit. Do you have a certain That's soil you know, like, volume that you have to plant the tree trees in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that has just, so the municipality of Lexington, we just changed that with the new green space ordinance. Green space ordinance? Yes. What? Uh, previously, there was no soil volume requirement, okay. which is absolutely important, right? Here at uh, University of Kentucky has also tried to, to do that. Um, let me wrap that up with the, the discussion of the arborist wood chip mulch, because it, it's all connected. Um, so arborist wood chips, so-called because usually they come from a tree care company that's grinding them up or whatever. Uh, they are a waste stream for these arborist companies. And if we are able to divert that waste stream and reuse it as mulch, that's awesome. And there's plenty of research, uh, more and more all the time coming out about how this is the best thing we can do for the trees. They're gonna insulate the soil, the roots, they're gonna hold moisture. Um, uh, they're gonna add slowly organic matter into the soil. Uh, feed the microbiota uh, there. Um, so, so really, I mean, there's no, there's no discussion about it. We should have wood chip mulch around our trees. And University of Kentucky was very forward thinking for this area in implementing this, uh, forming partnerships with local tree care companies to get them to bring uh, their, their wood chips to campus, which again is gonna reduce carbon emissions because they're not having to drive it out to wherever. Um, and unfortunately, some big donor at some point was probably walking around and said, that's ugly, stop doing it. And because people have millions of dollars and can put their names on buildings, they supersede actual good, rational, long-term ma land management decisions. And so the, um, the head of grounds here has left uh, before they could fire him. And it was actually, it's, a, it's an incredibly controversial thing that's happened recently. Uh, after UK started doing this, several other universities adopted it. It's an amazingly effective program, very successful. And now UK no longer has it. And it took about two years to retrain the, uh, the, the landscaping crew on campus here to move away from the triple shredded hardwood mulch, which is nonsense. Uh, you know, it's, it's pre-decomposed almost. It doesn't, it's a commercial product that doesn't give you what the wood chips give you. And that's what has conventionally always been used. Um, it took them two years to move away from that and get everybody trained up and buy into it. And then,
Okay, more leaf marcescence. So we know this is an oak or a beech, right? Probably it's an oak. And this is uh, this is called a shingle oak. Hmm. This is another one of uh, our red oaks. And this is going a bristle. It's called a bristle. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Finally. Okay. So this is a red oak. Yeah. See, it doesn't really have much. Uh, it doesn't have pointy lobes or anything, but it does have a little bristle tip. So there you go, shingle oak. Um, I want to say, uh, I want to rant about this building a little bit, uh, but we're going to have to get out in front of it to, to see something. Okay, so like I was saying earlier, Avenue of Champions, right? Front and center for the university marketing. Look at that. Front and center, they have a giant floating bag. <laughs> yeah, um, and it just looks like shit. So, what does that mean? It means that the, the commercial function of that building, which is the partnership with Starbucks and all that stuff is the He's most the important piece. Like, can you imagine as an architect ever agreeing right. to having that there? But the all the function of that building of the student center and its need to look good for the universe is completely subordinated to the commercial activity. So very interesting, and you will see that more and more in uh, in urban architecture. Uh, this here is a different kind of oak. This is a chinkapin oak. Uh, chinkapin, as, as, as much as we can tell, is a maybe derived from a Native American word meaning little nut. And indeed, um, these make uh, pretty, small, pretty small acorns. Um, and we also have these galls. On the twigs, so this is this is plant material that has been genetically uh, short-circuited by a chemical produced by an insect, probably a wasp, uh, that has laid its eggs. That genetic mutation kind of creates this gall around that spot, and the uh, the insect grows within. Okay, let's talk a little bit about racialized stuff as, as we walk through here. Uh, Avenue of Champions, this area here before the university expanded into it was called Adamstown, which was a primary, it was an entirely African-American hamlet or enclave within, or just neighborhood uh, within Lexington. And then of course, the university displaced that. And we have a Memorial Coliseum where there was a neighborhood. And I wanna say that there is a memorial marker uh, to that neighborhood that was put up in the last decade, maybe 2019. Uh, and I think it's like in the rear of Memorial Coliseum. It is definitely not front and center. So the history of Adamstown has just about been erased. There's also Prawl Town on the other side of campus. That very similar story, but they have been able to, uh, that neighborhood was able to maintain its integrity through community organizing, uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s, I want to say. Walk sign is on for all crossings. Walk sign is on for all crossings. Uh, Dr. Phillips, do you want to add anything about Adamstown? I mean, the university has a pretty shameful track record of displacing uh, communities of color from around the university. Um, as Naki said, this was all, you know, working class um, African-American communities and over by our library. They also took out another huge community. Freedman Settlements. Um, but you know, hey. So is this the 
20s or so? I mean, this looks like maybe 30s architecture, 30s. but was that when it's the neighborhood was displaced? It's actually more contemporary than you would think. Really? I thought okay. it was, yeah, I want to say it was built in the 40s. Okay. And this is where, you know, Adolf Rupp did his thing, if you keep up with basketball. Oh, no. Um, yeah, this, this was his Coliseum, and um, they're renovating it because, you know, we cannot not have a renovated building on campus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I apologize. What I identified as a chinkapin oak, now I'm looking at, I think that's just another swamp white oak. I think these are all swamp whites. Um, yeah, covered in galls. The other cool thing about swamp white oak is that it also has this exfoliating bark, which you can call ornamental or sorry oak. Um, but that, that is a really good ID characteristic for it. I've never seen so many galls on, yeah. on one plant. Yeah, they are. It seems like powerful. they're just they attracted like crazy. Right. Do people use galls to make ink? Is that something yes. else? Okay. Yeah. Uh, more tupelos, Nissa sylvatica. Note again that 90 degree attachment of the branches is super distinctive. What color is the ink? Like black ink. Like black? Yeah. Okay. Another service berry, again, my favorite Ooh. fruit. Also ornamental bark. <laughs> so these trees in these mulch rings, they come through and basically spray herbicides uh, to kill weeds. And Oftentimes they overspray and the trees will take up those herbicides. Um, and you will see that in deformations of the leaves coming out and things like that. I, I've definitely seen that all throughout here. Um, so, so just an, another thing that happens that's another stressor on urban trees uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have to deal with. Okay, yes, I think this, this one here is our chinkapin. And you can see very, they're chinkapins. <laughs> tiny, tiny little acorns. Uh, this is one of my favorite trees. It's a white oak species. It is bottomland adapted. We see it on our stream banks all around here. Um, it's, it's not as uh, culturally significant as the burr oak, which is sort of the iconic central Kentucky oak. Um, but it is absolutely, you know, some of, some of the oldest, best trees that we have in Fayette County are this species. Uh, behind it there, that is a red maple. You can tell from this distance because you can see the buds are starting to swell and they are bright, bright red. Red maple gets a bad rap now here uh, with a lot of ecologists because it is since we have removed fire from the landscape, right? Um, traditional Native American land management practices, as well as just normal wildfires, right? Forest Service spent most of the 20th century trying to just get fires out. Now they're starting to bring back that management. But without the fires there, you have um, these, what should be oak hickory dominated forests you have species like red maple that are a little more mesic, they're a little more uh, wet loving, moving in. And when that fire doesn't move through to knock them back, they start dominating the understory. Their leaves have a very different character than oak leaves. Um, they, again, create more of a, a moist habitat over time as they break down. And so you see a, a changeover in community composition in these forests. You get like more beech trees too when it gets more music? Uh, not here. They, they're they not really, they're not super adapted to calcareous soils, which is what we have here. Oh, okay. So I have not seen that. But, 
That makes sense. But Thank red maples are further, native. Further east. Yes. Right. Red so maples are native. Um, I would say red maples are another uh, overplanted urban tree, street <laughs> tree. Uh, they're a little smaller. Uh, there are some, some cultivated varieties that have a, a leaf shape that people really like. Uh, but I think uh, sugar maples provide a greater habitat service, I think. So we should, we should be encouraging more sugar maples as street trees, fewer red maples, at least here in town. I don't know what your cities maybe are like. Couple interesting things down there. Um, there's some Austrian black pines. We don't have to go look at. It. There's, uh, there's also uh, some hawthorns. Uh, I think there'll be more around the side here. So. Let's catch this cross if we can. So this way is going to take us more into the uh, the residential edge of campus where we'll see like the direct um, the border and some more uh, some more old plantings stuff, um, stormwater, yeah. a, lot, a lot of what I do is related to stormwater. Yeah, um, Yeah. really whatever I can get my hands on. Yeah. When you, know? you say housing access, what do you, how does that combine with the ecological? So uh, if, you, if you create uh, an amenity in a neighborhood like yeah. a, a food forest or something, yeah. uh, speculators will come in sure. and yeah. see, so yeah. you, have, you have to. Sure. Yeah. Basically. So what do you what do you do? I'm interested in cooperative housing, okay, yeah. community land trust, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> really anything, any social okay. housing. That's a lot of what I've worked on is housing. Oh, okay. And well, I'm I'd love to talk. Becoming more interested in the urban ecology stuff. Um, okay. These trees here, again, legibility, right? Every single one is yeah. the same. They're planted on even spaces. Right. I'm standing in the little pit. These are Japanese Zelkovas. Um, they are in the elm family, but they are not susceptible to Dutch elm disease, so they hang out. Um, but this this form that they take, we can keep walking. We can walk. um, they're all Zelkovas. This form that they take is called a, a vase, basically, and. It is, it is the shape, the, the iconic shape of the American elm that has now been mostly lost from the landscape. So Zelkovas are planted to kind of try and, and replicate that. Um, there's very poor, look at the angles of attachment on, on these very poor branch bark unions. So you get this included bark in here. All of these are gonna be failure points or potentially areas that rot could be introduced. This is just the natural form, more or less, of this tree, but nevertheless, um, you can see this is pretty bad right here. This might be, this might be frost damage, honestly. Um, so what you'll see with some of this is when we get the, the wild fluctuations in temperatures is that um, this will start flowing when it gets warmer and then it freezes again and you get these splits. So that, that could be what this is, I, I'm not sure, but as, as we assess these, you're gonna see probably multiple points uh, where you could suspect failure, or if, if we were managing this landscape, we would wanna get out ahead of it and prune it. Um, and you can see, this is, a, this is kind of a nightmare. There's all kinds of dead wood hanging up in there, right? Uh, so to some degree, it's a hazard. Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> is that a fig? Fig. That is not a fig. That is, uh, these are three white ashes here. I don't know what this is, but I know that I'm in an urban area and probably three of the same tree are going to be planted in a row. So if I know what those are, I'm making a really good guess. And now I'm going to confirm it. I look, 
I see, okay, it's got opposite branching structure, all this stuff. But yeah, this is a, this is a white ash. This is sort of our iconic ash species of the bluegrass. Um, it is being decimated by uh, the emerald ash borer. And so probably that's what happened here. Yes, they do treat the trees on campus, um, but they're in, they're in serious decline. Uh, but you can see this, uh, the roots are still alive and they're trying, they're trying to, to fight back. More red maple with the, the red. Uh, who knows what that one is? The plane tree? Ah! Or, oh, is that, 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 that plane? Yeah. No? That's no. Yeah, I, no. I would call that London plain. Or, yeah, London plain. Um, and for two reasons. One, and the, the bark is a little, it's a little greenish. Sycamore, American sycamore is going to be like bright, bright white. Um, but the other thing about it is that it's in an urban area. If I was out in the middle of the woods and I saw something like that, I would immediately say, okay, probably sycamore. But because I'm in an urban area, I need to at least suspect and think about London Plain. To be absolutely sure, I need to look at um, when it produces its seed clusters. Um, American sycamore will always be a, a single cluster. Uh, London Plain will occasionally have two together. And so that way you can, you can tell for sure. Um, but yeah, if that is London plane tree, that is a hybrid between um, the Asian plane tree and the American sycamore. And you, you put that little green tag is the reason? No, no, it's because the, the bark itself kind of looks green. Ah, okay. It's a little greenish versus like bright white. American sycamore and uh, well, so platinus occidentalis and platinus orientalis. And the orient okay. is uh, is called Asian plane tree, I think is the common name. Yeah. And I I think it's called London plane tree because that's where they did the hybrid. Okay. Yeah. Or it might just be because it's midway between the two. I'm not. Right. But you know, those <laughs> European horticulturalists were the the ones doing all that yeah. stuff. Huh. Um, it's all over New York City. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a okay. Is that the one, like, another one that also, does well in. Yeah, the, totally. Like Philly, uh, would that be the London plane instead of Sycamore? Probably. Like I I have not been to Philly recently, so I couldn't tell you. Like, but. I wonder if there's a time when they got into when the London plane got into. Like, oh yes. So, so like, yes. The older ones might actually be Sycamore. I don't know. So here's here's oh, okay. something. Uh, another three in a row. Uh, more Gladitsia. I don't know if these are shade masters, but I'm going to say they're um, honey locusts. Three in a row, planted all at the same time, right? We can kind of make that assumption. But they're obviously not doing the same. Right. What are some things that we might think about? Proximity to the building, right? So compaction of the soil, that's one thing. The biggest thing I'm noticing, though, more mechanical damage. So whatever, you know, this one is just never going to catch up to those because it's been set back. It's having to fight off that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crisscrossing utilities, yeah. underground, overhead. Lots of threats to a tree in a, in a city. We are officially heading back now. <laughs> These guys here are Kusa dogwoods. They actually have an edible fruit, but the uh, exfoliating ornamental bark, right, is yeah. the main thing. Um, like all dogwoods, it is opposite uh, branch. There is an alternate uh, branch dogwood, but um, and the the little buds. 
kind of look like little minarets to me, I guess. So that, that is one way that I, that I identify the dogwood. Here's a meadow uh, that we didn't look so closely at earlier, but a good, good example of those uh, lines running all the way up it. Alcobas had to have some cut off of it. Seen pretty pretty significant dieback right there too. Oh, this is this is interesting. Okay, ginkgo biloba, ginkgo biloba. Those were obviously planted on purpose, right? What about these? You know, I just called that a red oak. It might be a scarlet oak. This is why urban areas, really tough. Anyone could have planted anything. But these, I think these were planted, but probably by the birds, okay? What we have here is black cherry, Prunus serotina, beautiful, right next to a hackberry, common hackberry. Hackberry is a really key one to identify. It's super easy for anybody because it has this warty bark and it just like layers, uh, like leaves of a book or something. Uh, build up, build up, build up. Um, this, uh, this genus, Celtus, amazing. Um, all over the world in the archeological record formed uh, an important piece of, uh, of food systems. Um, going, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about it other than it's not appreciated for that. Um, but I think we need to be looking at it uh, kind of from that lens, from a climate adaptation food systems lens, because this is one tree that will pull water out of cracked clay. It's, it's one that really can survive in tough soils. Um, and, and there are some other species of it as well that have even better tasting fruit, uh, like the southern hackberry, the sugar hackberry. But this is very interesting because to me, to me, this is just, you know, the birds planted it and then no one cut them down and they got big enough, fast enough. These are pretty fast growing that eventually someone just started mowing around it. And now we have this, right? Where they're actually kind of uh, competing with each other. Also a hackberry. And these will re, both of these species will re-sprout if, uh, if you cut them. So I'm, I'm not sure that these two hackberries aren't actually just coming from the same uh, root crown. Are these the fruits from the, uh, the... Oh, there you go. We got a female ginkgo. <laughs> and, uh, and so because it's so old, we can maybe say potentially this was one of the ones that was planted uh, back before people you know, were really, really thinking about uh, only planting the males. One way, this is a, uh, this bigger one especially is a great example of um, an identification characteristic for the ginkgos are, uh, all of these, right? These little stems on there, nodules looking very distinctive. Another hackberry, same warty bark, but not, not as warty, not as distinctive as the other one. So there's genetic variability there. All right, so yeah, this is the, the northern extent of campus. And basically what you see here is soon to be gentrified student housing. Um, and, you know, every single one of these structures is on the chopping block, potentially, to be replaced with some sort of uh, mid-rise luxury condo apartments. Is this where they just up them? Uh, I don't know if they just, they did have a development uh, slated for the building on the corner there, uh, behind, behind this fraternity house. 
that got defeated, I want to say five years ago. I think they have just recently reapplied to, to do it again. So. Yes, um, cost of living crisis is huge, um, and and housing is the biggest the biggest element of that. Uh, right across the street there, that's a southern magnolia. But what I just want to point out is that it's been very poorly pruned. You see how it's uh, yeah, it's, it's got these limbs sticking out. Um, trees, tree, you know, when, when tree branches are growing, uh, they grow from the tips and they grow outwards and the bud at the tip produces a hormone that keeps all the other buds further down from growing. And if you prune incorrectly and you just chop that apical bud off, you will have what's called apical release where all of a sudden that hormone isn't controlling everything else and so you can see that yeah. it's just wanting to put out all this response growth. All that response growth is gonna be very poorly connected. It's not gonna have, you know, it's architecturally, it's gonna be very weak. So when you have poor pruning, especially over the course of decades, over and over, you compound your problems. Speaking of poor pruning, yeah. God. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Does anyone know what that bad tree is? That is Aelanthus altissima. Tree of heaven. Yeah, or or tree of hell. Yeah, it is uh it will not die, right? It absolutely will not die. And you see lots of response growth anywhere that it has been um, pruned yeah. away from the power lines. That is one of our worst actors as far as invasive plants. But it was for a long time and some places still is intentionally uh, put in the ground by horticulturalists. So now we're and dealing with the planners. legacy. It seeds itself out everywhere. Um, it's really hard to beat back. It always resuckers like this. And if that particular property owner doesn't know what they're dealing with, they're never going to do anything about it. <laughs> and you're going to find these seeding themselves out everywhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So Aelanthus is a, a host species for the spotted lanternfly, which is a terrible invasive insect that eats freaking everything. <laughs> like anything that I'm planting as, a, as an agroecologist, all the, the rose fruits, rose family fruits and, and maples and things like that um, are under threat by a spotted lanternfly. So actually Aelanthus could have an important role to play as an indicator species, an early indicator on the landscape that if we check Aelanthus, that's where we're likely to first find the spotted lanternfly. So there may be some value to having one in your neighborhood if you can just keep an eye on. You started seeing them and then they were everywhere. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You, just have, you have Pennsylvania to thank for being ground zero for those things. <laughs> Pennsylvania's ground zero for lots of things. <laughs> Okay, crab apples here, genus Malus, same genus as the apples you buy from the store, but these of course, pulpy, not juicy, not sweet, but they provide this uh, winter interest, right, in color. Uh, they're, they're beautiful trees, they, and they provide really solid rootstocks if you do want to graft uh, like a ornamental or uh, sorry a cultivated fruit onto them
too. I just recommend adding some sugar. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Typically, they're they're yeah. better for making jam or yeah. butter. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's a really good example of service berries ornamental bark. This is what it's planted for: is these striations. So this may actually be a, a cultivar that has like a more prominent kind of bark characteristic there. This is a birch. Uh, it's a gray birch, I think, which is a populifolius, maybe. Um, this would be a, a another relic of, a, of a, a horticulturalist coming here and putting kind of a weird oddball yeah. species. It is a native to North American species, but not a not a bluegrass one. Yeah. So here's a, another another example of a you can see it fits right in that little space. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess there's something to be said for that. I feel like it's probably they don't have to prune it, right? It's like there's a... Yeah. yeah. A, but you also got a bunch of dead in it and, right. you know, it's yeah. struggling. Oh, watch it, watch it. Sort of necessarily a cultivar. That's not something that's going to feel like in nature. It will. It could. Okay. It's a genetic mutation. Okay. Yeah. And if you yeah. found one in nature... Right. You could get it and patent it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. clone it potentially. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it. it's going to be a one in a million yeah. kind of thing, yeah. right? That's the story I heard about that sweet gum, the columnar sweet gum, was that somebody found it in eastern Kentucky. Yep. yep. And the the hilarious thing about the sweet the columnar sweet gums, if you know sweet gums, their their fruit, their seed pod is this cluster of achenes. It's very spiky. Yeah. And so. The, the fastigate, the columnar uh, sweet gums are supposedly uh, sterile, do not produce fruit. So they planted them everywhere and they're so happy and now some of them are starting to revert and putting on fruit. So you just can't win. Uh, yeah, nature finds a way, life finds a way, right? <laughs> um, oh, this is good. Okay, that orange one there. That is a lace bark elm or a Chinese elm. You can see why it's called lace bark. Again, ornamental bark providing winter interest. It is it is Chinese in origin. Uh, it seeds itself out everywhere. It's a terrible tree. Uh, stuff to talk about here. Um, this this one here is called Golden Rain Tree. It's sort of a, it's almost like a cousin to the Aelanthus and, and you know it provides these, uh, it's Asian, it provides beautiful cascades of uh, yellow flowers. It's not super invasive like, uh, like Tree of Heaven is, um, but something that you don't see so much planted anymore but is indicative of a time when horticulturalists were planting more of this kind of stuff. Uh, what I'm really interested in here though is these white pines. So these are eastern white pines. These are the tallest trees that we have in the eastern United States, I believe. They'll get up to 200 feet. They go. They are not native to the central bluegrass. You have to drive an hour east to get to the sandy soils of the Red River Gorge. Then they're fine. But they grow tall. They grow straight. So I don't know if the hospital planted this for the property owner, if the property owner planted it, but they were looking for visual screen, right? Evergreen. Unfortunately, because they're not native here, they break off all the time. Uh, they, I, I consider all of these to be a hazard. If I was this property owner, I would remove all of these or at least take them back and turn them into just habitat snags because when an ice storm comes through, the tops are gonna break out of all of these. And you can probably see a couple of them, I'm sure already have it. One has been lost here, you can tell. Uh, here's an, oh, this is good. <laughs> so here's the white pine they planted. And I think it's losing out to, this I believe is a white mulberry. So another tree that was planted, but planted by the birds. 
grew up fast enough and has basically just taken over this spot. Um, why, why is it that they break off more here than compared to their native range? You know, that's that's a good question. I think uh, it might have to do with the soils. Um, that, But uh, honestly, I, I don't know that. I, I just know that uh, Kentucky Division of Forestry used to tell people to plant them all the time. And now we've learned long enough. I, I have a client that I do chainsaw work every year after windstorms and stuff, and it's because of, of these. But there's some there's some crappy soils that this is the only thing that's going to grow. So it is, you know, if you can't get anything to grow, the white pine is, is, an, is a decent enough early succession to just get something going, start building some soil. Uh, although these are needles, right? They break down really slowly. Um, something behind you here. What do y'all think about this? Oh yeah. Honey locust? Interesting. No. Nope. Oh. Is that a little ginkgo? It looks thorny though, right? Yeah. No, it's not not a ginkgo. Hmm. I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm gonna call this a calorie pear. Oh yeah. This is right. an invasive pear right. that was planted somewhere on purpose, and then a bird planted this. Oh. Uh what's really nasty about this guy is look at the size of these thorns yeah. right yeah. so this is um this is not what it looks like when it's planted as a as an aristocrat pear or a bradford pear you've probably heard them called they are calorie pears and then they produce these really hard inedible fruits that the birds love to take and they plant them here and again, probably the landscapers see this and it grew up so fast and they can't kill it that they're just like, well, obviously it's meant to be here. But there's no way that they want a tree with a bunch of giant thorns right in front of their side, right? Yeah. So until someone notices that this is not supposed to be here, it's just going to keep getting bigger and right. bigger and bigger. Did, did you say the calorie pear and the Bradford pear are the same? Yeah, so the, the genus and species is Pyrus caloriana. Uh, Bradford is one of those uh, copywritten mm. cultivars okay. uh, and so Bradford was released and, and became very popular as a street tree uh, and then they started falling apart because they had very poor branch structure and so then they came out with the aristocrat pear which is another brand name for this same species it's a little larger and that's mostly what when you see uh, pears planted now that's that's what it is uh, so you'll you'll hear people call them uh, Bradford pears, kind of just generally, uh, but calorie pear is, is is really what it is. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's go around here. We'll stay away from the, the loud noises, and we're almost back to Patterson. It's 11:40. Uh, just a heads up. 11:40 now. Yeah. River birches, Betula nigra, uh, another bottomland adapted species, inundated soils with exfoliating ornamental bark. <laughs> Enough said, right? This one is actually native. It doesn't grow like this naturally. They do this in the nursery. They'll chop it back and let it re-sprout. Uh, three is kind of the standard that you'll buy like that. Um, I, I don't know why they do that. They just, you know, Think it looks better or whatever. Uh, these can be kind of a nightmare. They seed themselves out like crazy. So unless you want tons of little river birches everywhere, don't put it in your home landscape. These here, more ornamental bark. These are hawthorns. Well, this is a, a crab apple, but those two are hawthorns. Same family. Also put on little fruit. As the name suggests, hawthorn, they usually have a bunch of thorns. This one, however, is a, another brand name. 
You got a thorn? Oh yeah. It coming out. Uh, this one is called Winter King. Crataegus viridis Winter King. It's a non-native. Um, spruce guys if, if anybody wants to know what a spruce feels like uh, this I want to say it's probably Colorado blue um, but it's they're spiky and so that's just if, if you don't have a good feel for what a for what a spruce is it's something that you can uh, definitely get a feel for feel like a novice yeah you know? for sure okay that's that's it really uh thank, thank you, you all for for sticking that through that i know it was cool thank you, you. that was awesome thank, thank you yeah. 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 you're so amazingly yeah. fun yeah. yes wow thank thanks you. Job, thank you yeah. um, <laughs> right. I, I really appreciate that um yeah. I exist online as Geomancer Permaculture. Feel Great. free to find me, Instagram, YouTube, all that stuff. Tell your friends. Uh, we're doing crowdfunded uh, crazy permaculture. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. You can't find them online. Oh, I found you. <laughs>